If there was one engine to which you judge all other engines reliability by, it's what we're going to tear down today. A Ford 4.9 liter 300 straight six. Everyone has good things to say about these engines. I've never heard anybody talk any kind of crap on these. Yes, you can kill them. We've proven on this channel that it doesn't matter how good something is, there is someone that will go out of their way to ruin it. But arguably, this may be the most reliable mass-produced engine ever. I've seen so many of these trucks, 400, 500, 600,000 miles, no problems. They leak oil, who cares? Just keep them full. It doesn't matter. And that's probably why it's been so tough to find one of these engines. In the Midwest, we treat the roads with way too much salt and these trucks rusted away a long time ago, which is why I haven't really been able to find one. It's not like the engines go bad and they go to the junkyard, they rust away and then they get scrapped. So I finally found a 300 straight six. These engines came out in the 1960s as the 240. Sometime in the 70s, they became the 300. And of course they went through some changes. They became fuel injected, electronic ignition, but not a lot of evolution here. This still doesn't have a cross flow head. It's pretty archaic technology. Now these engines were used in Ford trucks, Ford vans. They were also used in heavy equipment, large trucks, in stationary power plants like water pumps. I've seen them in excavators. I've even seen them in car crushers. These engines will run at 3000 RPM for ever, and they're pretty efficient at the same time. Again, it's really hard to poke fun at this engine. It's a tractor engine. It's old, I get it, but they are super reliable. One thing you'll note about this engine, this particular engine, it's rough. It's really beat up. Everything's broken. That bracket's broken. The thermostat housing is broken. There's all kinds of smash stuff here. And that's because I had to dig this out of a scrap bin. That's what it took to get a 300 on the channel. Worth it. First things first, let's pull the spark plugs. Oh, really? Oh, it fell down here. We're good. Well, it's pretty clear that these plugs have some miles on them. What's interesting to me is they mostly look the same except for this one. This one's pretty clean while the rest of them are really dirty. And it doesn't look newer than the rest, it just looks clean. So maybe there's a problem with cylinder five. Either way, these are pretty ugly looking, but no malice in the combustion palace that I can see. The next thing we're going to do is see if it actually does turn over. Hopefully I don't break my wooden crate here. Oh no. Nope. What about backwards? Oh, I got the bolt out. She's locked up solid. Before we go too crazy with this, I'm going to pull all the accessories off, like the alternator, the AC compressor, the power steering pump, which is smashed. We're going to kind of clean it up a little, makes it a little easier to work on. Next, we're going to remove the clutch and flywheel and the shim so that we can try to get this mounted to an engine stand. How does the clutch look? Rusty. Pretty worn. Not, uh, not totally smoked. Well, I guess it is kind of down to the rivets in places. So yeah, that clutch is bad. Probably still move the truck. Now for the flywheel. Hmm. Is it really locked up though? That was uh, interesting. Oh, well that doesn't look too promising behind that either. I'm gonna take another stab at turning this thing over. That way you can watch the back of the uh, crankshaft to see if it actually does turn over. Oh yeah. It, but it's got some really, really bad tight spots. Oh, we're powering through, making bad noises. 
this motor might be just fine. We're still tearing it down. Next, we'll get the alternator out of the way. I'll be. Oh, okay. Well, let's just give it a little tap. Yeah, that works. One junk smog pump. All right, that was tight. Next, we'll start prepping the upper plenum. Let's get the EGR pipe out of the way. Now there's a plenum support bracket. PCV valve. That was real difficult. Now the plenum to the lower manifold bolts. Yes, there's some electronics. What I miss? Next, we'll get the emission solenoids off the valve cover. And now we can pull the valve cover. Wow, oh, this should be pretty difficult. Now, some of you may be wondering, why have I not put this on a stand yet? Well, I don't have bolts, but the internet says that the head bolts have the same thread and pitch as the bell housing. So we're going to get a couple head bolts out of it and get it mounted to a stand next. But I had to get this far to get to the head bolts. I think I'm going to pick two of the outer ones. We're going to try one first, see how that goes. Come on, internet, don't let me down now. Oh yeah, the internet never lies. I mean, what I meant to say there, it didn't lie this time. All right, let's pull three more. Of course, we're gonna do things in order. So, I got it mounted. And this is how we're going to attempt, attempt, I, I think, to get this on here. It's gonna be just fine. Yeah, just fine. Bolts for safety. We're testing this engine stand again. Yeah, see? Hoorah. Now I'm gonna drain it because I'm pretty sure it's still got fluid in it even though it was in a scrap box, can never be too safe. I'm sure it's just a little residual. Or maybe it's just full. Now we'll try to get the rest of this EGR pipe out. This doesn't look like it's gonna come out, but we'll try. No way. Amazing. Now we can start unbolting the intake manifold. I need to uh, change the angle of the injector real quick. Oh, stuff's happening. What's going on here? Well, there's one exhaust manifold, and I bet there's one more bolt on this side. Well, maybe there's more than that. So the intake moves freely. Oh, it's the engine support bracket. 
Okay, we'll just, just, oh, I've got some more wires and stuff. Oh, that's just, okay. I did not expect that, but. Let's take this all the way over here and I have one ground wire, which I'll get to in a minute. So this might be loud. There's like a whole bunch of stuff hinged on this one bolt. Oh, that was, that was pretty simple. Let's take a look at some ports here. That exhaust port looks good. This intake port looks bad. Now there's no chunks of metal in there, but it is kind of rusty, which tells me it could have been chewing on some coolant. Exhaust port looks good. Intake looks a little rusty. Good. Pretty good. 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 Yeah, the rest of this, a little bit of carbon in there or whatever that is on the top of the intake valve. Looks all right. Now we'll pull the rockers and push rods. The valve train all looks pretty good. All the rockers look all right. The finish where all the push rods roll is nice and even. None of the push rods appear to be bent. They are really dirty. But who knows how many miles are on this engine. Time to break the rest of the head bolts loose. This dipstick is gonna wear me thin. Save all these head bolts for engine mounting purposes in the future. Not saying I'm gonna get more 300s in, but these bolts are free. Now I bet this head isn't the lightest since it's, you know, cast iron. Let's, uh, let's use blue here to crack the seal. Oh, I, there's no way I was gonna do that. Yeah, that's not as heavy as I thought. Well, I can see what's wrong with it right away. Look at that head gasket. Right there, 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 and there. Looks rough. It's not torched through, but... And, uh... Man, the coolant in this thing is disgusting. Well, looking at the bores, there's definitely been some water in this cylinder, you know, because there's water right there. And there's signs of rust in some of the others. Cross-hatching is visible at the bottom of the bore, but not so much at the top. I wonder if I'll have any trouble getting these rods and pistons out. They don't look terrible, though. The cylinder head, I didn't really see any cracks. I don't really know where these are known to crack if they are even known to. The cylinder five plug did not look the best. It was actually, it did look the best and that was what was suspect. And it could be in that area that it was drinking some coolant. Maybe from one of these water jackets. It's hard to say so far. Now normally you'd use a fan clutch wrench to get this off, but I'm gonna pull this all off with the water pump, the pulley, all at one time. I know this is probably stupid, but I'm still gonna do it. So the idea is if I just give it a little tap, it'll pull out of the block. and I'll have more room to turn the ratchet. OK. 
Okay. Oh, the coolant does not look good. Well, there is a rust line, which tells me this thing sat with uh, water in it, probably, which is why the coolant looks like this. And it probably wasn't full. It was probably driven when it was low. I also noted that the rear freeze plug looks like it could have been leaking, which would explain this mess down here. The water pump itself doesn't really look too bad. It's actually, it would clean up pretty well. You know, if I had a Ford 300, I would definitely keep this. Now we'll get this harmonic balancer off. I've got my polar mounted. I'm a little worried because the threads are not in good shape on this uh, balancer. So I'm gonna do this by hand. I don't know if it's going to work or not. Oh yeah. Nice and easy. Now let's get this timing cover off. I think that's the block, but I'll take it out anyway. That's all there is. No chain, no belt. That really can't fail. The last thing I'd like to do before we flip this over, I guess the second to last thing, let's get the distributor out of the way. Just give it a little, no, just a little. I hope I don't break it. Whew, that is corroded. That's been in there for a few minutes. Uh, it's cut, sawed, I, that probably happened at the scrapyard, I'm going to guess. Now, my arch nemesis, the dipstick tube, we got this. Wait, what? Oh, I kind of like that. I wish they were all like that. All right, let's get this thing turned over. I'm sure it's it would never make a mess for me. Never. It's not leaking anything. That's suspicious. Very suspicious. Oh, there we go. Ooh, that's not coolant. Oh, there's the real mix milkshake. Oh, thank you for putting that on my floor. I love it. It's exactly where I wanted it. Now let's get this pan out of the way, shall we? This will probably just pop right off. Oh yeah. Whoa. Oh, it's reeks of old gasoline. Woo! Huh. Why did I take such a deep breath of that? Uh. Pretty sure this is a Felpro Permadry. Got some splits in it. Someone used some orange RTV. It's not the right color, but it's been leaking. I don't know about the whole permadry thing. More like a tempadry. The first thing that hit me as soon as I cracked this pan loose was the smell. It smells like nasty varnished gasoline, which could be that this 
wouldn't start. It was fuel washed and it filled the crankcase filled with fuel. But if you look a little closer at the pan, you'll see it's got this mass of not incandescent gas. It's like rubber. That's oil. That that's what happens when sludge gets even harder. Yeah, look at this. It's like this is like the worst kind of chocolate fudge I've ever seen. But by far the worst part is the fact that I don't think that's plastic. I think that's sludge. Yeah, that's that's just shaped sludge. Ooh, that's plastic. That's that's hard plastic. That's not good. Yeah, I can't squeeze that and turn that back into oil. So where did that come from? Any uh, any guesses there? There's a better look at that piece. The pickup sure liked it. Let's get this pickup removed. Now we're going to see what was inside the pickup. Obviously, it's leaking some oil out. Just going to blow a little bit of air in here and cough. Oh, man. It really doesn't look that bad. Didn't shoot any chunks of anything out. Yeah, it's just dirty oil. Next, we'll remove the oil pump. Now we're going to turn this over. No. Nope. Yep. That does not turn over well. Something worth mentioning, when I went to remove the pickup, it left part of itself behind. So that was broken. Time to start pulling rods and pistons. Of course, we got to start at the front. And one rod and piston out. Oh man, this thing does not like to turn over. I wonder why. Well, that one came out not nearly as nice, and the first one was pretty rough too. Well, that one came out a lot easier. It still doesn't turn over that great. It's better, it's just not great. Now oh, this, this one's coming out pretty easy. All right, last and least. The rod bearings look pretty decent considering but they are definitely worn, especially that lower shell. It's definitely through the first layer. The uppers are starting to show some copper as well. This was definitely a tired old motor. And here's the rods and pistons. 
Cylinder one, there's some scratches on the skirt. It's not terrible. But look at the size of those rings, especially those oil rings. We don't see anything like that in modern engines. Some more damage there. It seems to all be on the same side of the piston. Cylinder four. And the wrist pins are really they're like notchy and it's very stiff. I wonder why. I can barely move that one. That's probably why that engine was so tough to turn over at certain spots. And then cylinder five. Remember that spark plug looked really clean and so does the piston. It looks uh, a lot cleaner than the rest of them. I would bet that there might be some small cracks in that head or maybe it was the head gasket. And it might have been chewing on some coolant. Some steam cleaning maybe. Also pretty significant skirt wear. And in cylinder five I also found a piece of quagmired oil from the Pangea sludge factory in the bottom of the pan. This is just, uh, yeah, yuck. Why did I do that? Now I have to touch something. Cylinder six, kind of the same story. Nothing is too torn up, just a little wear everywhere. Let's go ahead and get this crankshaft out of here. Smells like an old aquarium. You think that this crank would just like that, yeah. I'm actually going to uh, go weigh this crankshaft because I'm curious. I bet it's heavy. Yeah, it's heavy. Well, this crankshaft and my camera battery, 71 pounds. So we'll just call it 70 pounds. That's a heavy crank. Well, the main bearings do show some significant wear as well. Especially like right there. Something went through there. Pretty much worn down to the copper. Not all the way through. We've seen worse on the channel, but Still probably ran. The crankshaft would definitely need to go to machine shop before use. Every journal seems to have some, some grooves, some scratches. It's not as bad as if it spun a bearing or deleted a bearing, but there's still wear and damage present. This thing just keeps going. Oh, found the end. There is one thing left to do, and that is pull the cam. This should be pretty simple. The cam does have some wear as well. The lobes just don't look that great. They're actually kind of rusty. Or maybe that's oil varnish. The journals on the cam also have some wear, but they're not terrible. And looking in the block, the cam journals look pretty decent. Found some more chunks. That's oil. That's ridiculous. Some of that Haveline maybe from the 90s, you know, it's the same stuff. Not saying that that's bad oil or anything, but just saying it's that old. Yeah, bearings don't look too bad. Something else I noticed on the block were these numbers written on the deck. Is that factory or has this block been to a machine shop? 
the, this cylinder is probably the roughest. It's got some rust, some pitting, and some pretty significant scoring. All of the bores are scored on that side. That cylinder one was by far the worst. You can see some of the cross hatching towards the bottom of these. I looked this thing over pretty closely one last time and I still don't see any cracks. I don't know if these heads are known for cracking. We don't really get a lot of 300s here in the shop. So I can't really tell you from personal experience. I hope you guys didn't really think I'd find a catastrophically failed 300 straight six. I mean, sure, I've seen pictures on the internet of people that have driven through ponds and rivers and oceans and chucked rods out of the side of the block, which pretty much any engine, if you do that, will have some sort of negative consequence. This engine didn't have anything too terrible, and I say that with a grain of salt. This was a pretty ugly looking engine on the inside. The amount of sludge at the bottom of the pan, the pickup was clogged, most of the way clogged. Still don't know where that piece of plastic came from. If you know where that came from, put it down in the comments, let me know. I'm always learning from reading your comments. And this was the first 300 I've ever torn down. I think I've done plugs and maybe a valve cover gasket on one, and that's about it and it was probably 15 years ago, or 20. Ugh. Anyway, this was a very simple teardown. This is essentially one of the simplest engines to tear down that's, I mean, I would dare say it's simpler than a small block Chevy. I think it is, I think so. Anyway, this was a really easy teardown. There's not really a lot of value in these engines because they don't really fail that often but if you'd like to buy parts from this maybe for your desk or your wall some of it might make some good wall art or if you want to buy parts off of anything else I've torn down say you're looking for a Coyote 6R80 swap I've got a couple of them in stock right now you can go to importapart.com peruse our inventory and if you don't see what you're looking for you can always shoot us an email by filling out the part request form it sends us an email of exactly what it is you're looking for I really hope you enjoyed this teardown. I really don't think I'll have another one of these in the shop. It took two years to find this one. As always, I love all the comments, all the feedback, and even the criticism. I love it all, and I'll catch you on the next one.